So this is joint work with uh, Yarek Blasiok and uh, Preetam Nakiran, who are students at Harvard, and Venkat and Atri, whom probably many of you know. Um, <coughs> so the, the goal uh, of this talk and research uh, in a fair amount of this area is to, uh, starts with Channel's uh, 1948 theorem, which says that for every noisy channel, there is a notion of um, sort of an, you can associate a real numbered, positive real numbered value, call it its capacity, and communication at rate less than capacity is possible, rate greater than capacity is not. I won't do all the formalization that would need to be able to specify this theorem in complete generality, but I'll look at one special case, which is good enough for our talk today, which is you have the binary symmetric channel BSC. There is a real numbered parameter P, which is the probability with which it will flip bits. It takes as input a single bit, an element of GF2, and it outputs that bit with probability 1 minus P and flips the bit with probability P. Okay? And it acts independently on every bit. So this is a simple probabilistic stochastic channel. Hey, Tony. Um, and uh, the goal is to be able to deal with this noisy channel of communication and to be able to uh, <coughs> be able to send some message and then recover it completely correctly with very high probability. So in th the capacity for this channel, the expression given by Shannon was 1 minus the binary entropy of P, where entropy of P is P log 1 over P plus this thing. So it's some particular well-defined expression. This is some quantity that's going to be between 0 and uh, 1. Entropy of 0 is 0. Entropy of 1 half is 1. And the capacity of the channel sort of is 1 minus this quantity, whatever it is. Okay? So <coughs> the goal of achieving channel capacity is something that's a commonly used phrase. There are many papers that you will find in the literature which say we've now achieved capacity. And they all mean different things with it. So sometimes it's an empirical statement, sometimes it's a theoretical statement. And uh, this is, so for instance, one could ask, you know, what is the smallest? So the, the, the typical model in this uh, uh, game that we're playing over here is we're going to use this channel repeatedly many, many times. If I use the channel n times, I would like to be able to achieve a certain amount of communication, communicate a certain number of bits, which may be much smaller than n r times n, where r is what's called the rate of communication. And r times n, we would like r to be as large as possible. This r was the capacity in the previous thing. You can say, OK, as n tends to infinity, I can achieve 1 minus the entropy, binary entropy of p. But what's the smallest n for which I can actually do this? I mean, or if I decide that the rate capacity of some particular channel is 90 percent, meaning as n goes to infinity, I can send 0.9 n real bits over when I use this n times. But on the other hand, suppose I'm willing to go up to 80 percent of the capacity uh, of you know, usage. What is the smallest n at which I can get 80 percent of you know, the bits through, push through at 80 percent rate? But that's called achieving? So, uh, right. So, uh, and so 80 percent wouldn't be achieving. Then you ask the question, what's the rate at which we are, you know, so now I'll make this gap to capacity even smaller, C minus R smaller, and then that'll give me a different N, and I keep achieving this. And so achieving is in the limit, but we want to understand what is the rate at which we are approaching, approaching this limit. Okay? So if you want 0 0.01, then this will say, okay, if I take C to be, uh, the rate to be 0 0.01 less than capacity, then I need to use N, which is like 10,000 and so on and so forth. Okay. So, so that's the capacity of Shannon's construction? The no. So, so yeah, so even what Shannon himself, if you just followed through the construction and you do the, you know, the right bounds, and this is some form of you know, Chernoff bounds where we are familiar with the 1 over epsilon squared here or there, that will usually convince you that you know, if you took n to be growing roughly scaling like 1 minus 1 over epsilon squared, where epsilon is the gap between the actual capacity and the rate at which you're trying to communicate, you should be able to achieve this capacity. But this is not algorithmic achievement. Algorithmic achievement would say, well, we want to do all this with efficient algorithms. Okay? So algorithms that are scaling nicely in the parameters of interest. Now, what are the parameters of interest? So if you've seen this work of Forney from 1966, it was actually principally motivated by this 
application. What he showed was that you can actually get an <coughs> algorithm whose running time scales something like a polynomial in the length of the encoding, but it's also exponential in this gap to capacity. Okay. This is what encoding time. Decoding. Encoding and decoding. Both. So all the so yeah, uh, all the uh, computational costs. The encoding time is really n squared. Okay. There's really none, none of the rest. But the decoding time actually involves this two to the one over epsilon squared. So um, <clears throat> initially, this was viewed, at least I mean, by most of us, in the 90s when an, I was, I would look at this question. I would say, okay, that's achieved capacity. That's all I need to worry about. But uh, there was concern in the coding and communication community, as well as uh, then eventually, I think, a work of Luby, Mitzenmacher, Shokrulahi, and Spielman actually spelled this out. They said, well, you know, this exponential dependent on one over uh, dependence on one over epsilon squared is a killer. So 90% capacity, I want to only achieve 80% rate, and I'm going to spend time, which is 2 to the 100, right there, and not to mention the additional complexity. So they proposed this question saying, let's actually try to get running time, which is polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Choose any n you want, as small as you want, as large as you want, but try to get a, uh, running time, which is polynomial in this 1 over epsilon. What is the, you know, can you do this? And this question remained open till 2008. And then came these two works. I would say, OK, Arikan came up with this beautiful idea of these codes called the polar codes. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, <clears throat> it seemed to be a very, very radically different way of uh, analyzing, uh, you know, of encoding and decoding. Uh, I don't know of any particular theorem over here that I would be able to uh, used to get this result, but then eventually Guruswami and Shia and Hassani et al. Uh, showed that actually using these family of codes, you can actually get, you know, uh, achieve this theorem. And this is this result that I really want to talk about today. For a while, at least my motivation for most of this work was I wanted to take these two things, and these definitely belong in a book on coding theory. We, Guruswami and Rudra and I, are trying to write a book on coding theory. We thought this result should be explained there. But unfortunately, there was the, the proofs were a little too complicated. So our goal was mainly let's get the proofs sort of more modular. And along the way, we end up getting some generalizations. But the goal is to get to the proof of this result. So it's probably worthwhile since you are uh, mm -hmm. It works for right. It's a it's a very um, I mean very 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 robust result. Uh, but I mean I would say even Forney is any channel because uh, you're just going to concatenate a code once it, you know you get the, there's Forney's idea is we work with small codes of length one over epsilon squared. Then you can do brute force encoding and decoding. It doesn't matter uh, what channel you're working with; you can always get that, and then you'll still make a few errors, which you'll kill by some extra uh, error corrections. That's also the dependence there is n log n. Forget the epsilon in uh, Arikan itself. So, right. So in Arikan, the dependence is an a fixed n log n, provided your code is good for that given choice of n, and then you know it's a question of. So that's the main question that. We're going to look. So, what's the epsilon, and what's the n for which you actually get epsilon close to? So, the context for our talk is, I mean, for our work, technically is, I mean, other than the fact that we want to get clean proofs, is that Arikan's result actually was for a very general class of codes. He opened up a family of things, saying, okay, we'll start with some matrix. We'll see the matrix later, if at all. And any matrix would lead me to, or any one of a very broad class of matrices would lead to polarizing codes. Whereas Guruswami and Shia and Hassani et al. basically took one, one single matrix in this family and said, this one matrix, actually we can do the calculations and it works out. So one question was, so what's the general, why was this gap there? There is this feature phenomenon called strong polarization. And I actually like strong polarization in uh, addition, I mean, just this idea of polarization seems to be a very, very, very nice concept. 
a nice concept that we should be studying more uh, explicitly in probability theory, forget uh, 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 error correcting codes. And uh, this uh, concept is not been sort of very well studied. Arikan et al. was able to show that a gen the entire general classes actually polarizes in some slightly weaker sense, whereas you needed a particular strong polarization. I will talk about these later. And they were only able to apply to one family of codes over here. So, we want to study this gap and try to explain is there a difference. And so, in this talk, we will actually try to introduce a new way of looking at polarization, which we call uh, we look at the local polarization effects. And we will prove that this local polarization immediately implies strong polarization, a result which will have nothing to do with information theory. And the rest of it, which is saying, oh, yeah, all the codes that we had actually polarized locally. And so everything that we, for which Arikan could prove this result, we can now say, well, they'll all be good enough to actually get you polynomial time convergence to capacity. Now, the generality, et cetera, I'm mentioning as a sales thing, we'll really not get to it in the talk. We'll probably just talk about the basic result and see why it works. So, what are polar codes? Probably high time we started talking about this. And then this idea of uh, local versus global polarization. What is this and what is strong polarization? A little bit of the analysis. This is what we plan to do in the talk. Um, Avi, what time do I stop? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Sounds good. So there are some detours that I have, like what is the actual algorithm and so on, which I can talk about, but maybe we'll sort of do this interactively. So feel free to uh, and ask me questions at all times, of course. We know that. All right. So uh, first thing, we will not be talking about error correcting codes in this talk. Okay. So this is lesson zero. It's a beautiful lesson, which somehow um, I don't know if people always knew this or people never knew this or something, but this is never, I don't remember knowing this explicitly. But all you need in order to be able to correct random errors is a linear compression scheme. Okay? So, what is a linear compression scheme? It should be a matrix H where compression take, is multiplying by this matrix H. So, it takes n letter strings and compresses them to m letter strings by multiplying by that matrix. Okay? So, decoding, so you com I mean, just being able to compress is not very useful. You should be able to decompress, extract the original information out. And this original information should be decompressed. We only want to be able to, able to do the compression and decompression nicely for a very simple distribution independent Bernoulli bits. Okay? If I just told you we want to compress a sequence of independent Bernoulli bits, it would be very, very, very easy to do it. You know roughly how many bits are going to be zeros and how many are going to be ones, and you would come up with some encoding scheme, but that would not be linear. What we want to do is do this by a linear transform. I will stress the decoding is not going to be linear. That is obvious. I mean the decoding, we want its space to look like a ball, not a subspace, but the encoding should be linear map. The guarantee that you want is that if I pick a random vector z tossed from the Bernoulli uh, distribution with parameter p and n things, then the decompression of h times z, sorry, the decoding, yeah, the decompression of h times z will be equal to z with very high probability. The probability that they are not equal is at most epsilon. We would want all this with an efficient algorithm d that would make the entire process efficient, but the main thing that we want in addition is that the compression is just multiplying by this matrix Z, H. Okay? So, here I should think of Z as the noise? Exactly. So, if we think of Z as the noise, this will allow us to be able to work with, uh, you know, transform a solution. So, once you have a, this is basically a, a compression question and a compression definition of what is a solution for a compression problem. Why does it relate to coding theory? Why is it, why is it compression? Uh, why is it compression? Because H times Z is going to be smaller than Z. In fact, we want m over n to be roughly the entropy of p. Yeah. Okay, so this is our target. Now that's what syndrome decoding is, right? Or, uh, or decoding theory is that how they That's how you uh, probably think about. Yeah, exactly. So I'm given the syndrome, and so in fact, yeah. Let me explain to you why this implies coding. So let's take the 
the null space the, or the orthogonal matrix a, uh, H perp, which satisfies the condition that H times H perp is zero. Okay, so H perp will have sort of n minus n uh, columns or some such thing. Encoding should be just multiplying by H perp. Okay, so a vector x should be encoded by multiplying by H perp. This will take one minus entropy of p or n minus m bits and map them to n bits. This is an expansive map. And what's the decoding for this thing? How do you take, how do you do error correction? If I'm given a noisy corrupted message, so, so what are you, you didn't have in that first segment? The encoder is just h times z. Was that? H is the parity check of this code, yeah. and right, okay. So that's why we call it H. But over here, compression was multiplying by H. Over here, so so what happens if you transmitted H times X, and then got some error eta? Eta is going to be distributed according to the Bernoulli distribution, right? It's independent Bernoulli bits. What should you do to decompress? Well, you first multiply what you received a y with h. You have the vector h available, y is your receiver's input. You multiply the two and you apply the decompression to it. What will you get? Well, this will be with high probability. Uh, this will turn out to be exactly eta because h times h perp times x is zero. And so you're really getting h times eta. And this thing says that if I give in h times eta, then I'll usually get eta as the decompressed value. And I'm getting y minus eta. This is exactly what was the transmitted code word. Okay, this is make sense. It's a very simple conceptual step. But from now on, throughout the talk, we are just compressing information, compressed by a linear map. Any questions at this stage? All right. So the neat thing about Arikan, so see, we still have to find out, so where are we going to get this matrix H from that we will use to compress things? And you know, usually when we are thinking about error correcting codes, which are trying to operate at rate, you know, at a gap epsilon from capacity, we say, let's start to build a big enough object where we can detect this gap between the rate and capacity, so some object which is of size 1 over epsilon squared, and then try to do something. But by this time, we are sort of already behind in the game. If we haven't constructed an object which we know how to operate on algorithmically, how are we going to do it in the future? The amazing thing about Arikan is that you can actually start operating on two bits at a time and say he's going to do something non-trivial with it in terms of compressing it. I mean, how do you compress two bits when you know the entropy is some unknown p and you're only given a little bit more capacity than entropy of p times n you might be given epsilon n more coordinates but whatever but at two bits you're not going to see this so still he says okay look there are some transform transformations which can be very interesting in this context so here's an example take two bits u and v and output u plus v, this is parity, this is addition is modulo in F2, and v. Okay. On the one hand, this is a completely invertible transformation. Obviously, given the output, I can tell you what the input is, so nothing has changed. On the other hand, what we have done is polarized the bits, the outputs. u and v were identical, suppose u and v were identical Bernoulli bits. The output, one of them is a little bit more entropic than either u or v. The other bit actually is not any less entropic than what we started with. In fact, it's the same bit that we started with, but it's a little less entropic condition on knowing u plus v. If I told you what u plus v is, v is a little bit more given. So when you say u, v identical, you mean they are IID? They're not the same bits. They are uh, sorry, yeah, I, uh, identically distributed. Yeah. Right, correct. Okay. Why is v a little bit there? So, so you, given u plus v, v is less. This is the yeah the, the other the side of the XOR lemma. U plus V is the XOR lemma output, which we always paid attention to. We are now paying attention to the uh, the you know the, the the waste that we are generating. And this is an invertible transformation, which is why V has to be less entropic because U plus V is more entropy, right? All right. So 
Right. So, this is something that we have already said and now comes this idea which takes some implementation, but what it roughly says is okay, this started with two you know identically distributed bits and produce one which is a little bit more random and the other one which is only conditionally little less random, but let us ignore conditioning just pretend oh it is less random than what we started with. Now, the idea is we will just repeat this process take another pair of bits which is like u prime v prime u prime plus v prime and v prime. Now, take u and v u plus v and u prime plus v prime apply the same 2 by 2 process to those 2 bits they started off being independent and identically distributed. So, again we will polarize them a bit more and v prime and v double v double prime we again apply the same process and they were identically distributed bits and we will polarize them a bit more. Now, there is a little bit of sneaking going on I mean if I could completely ignore conditioning this makes some sense, but if I do ignore conditioning v is not any less random than what I started with. So, I have to work with conditional probabilities. So, you have to make all of these statements make sense and so on. I probably would not do it in complete great detail, but I will do it sort of in a very sketchy fashion. Before I do that just to make sure we are on the same page I will flash a page of information theory preliminaries. It will be quick, but and I apologize for that in case you are not familiar with it, but I suspect most people have seen these things before. So, just this will just be serve as a memo of the things that you should learn about information theory if you did not already know it. Sorry, where is this? Ah, okay, all right. So, if this plan is somehow successful and I keep taking pairs of bits which are identically distributed and polarize them, after a while some bits will be polarizing you know will be heading towards entropy of roughly 1 that is the maximum you can get. Other bits will be heading towards entropy of 0. Let us assume everything went to either 1 or 0. Now, all the bits which have entropy 1 are totally random all the bits which have entropy 0 these have entropy 0 conditioned on knowing the entropy 1 bits, but you know whatever I do not have to output those because you know and though this completely gives us a polarizing transformation you polarize all the n independent bits somehow get a bunch of bits which are completely random and I tell you what the values of those bits are and a bunch of bits which have no entropy condition on those previous guys I just do not need to tell you what they are because they have no entropy there is no information there. Okay. One way to say it works fast for learning people is that you take the <coughs> an, an IID string of length n with some uh, bias p and produces a bit fixing yeah. source. Bit fixing bit source. source. Well, some coordinates are fixed and the others are totally random. I see. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, and bit fixing. So bit fixing allows the fixed bits to be a function of the yes. unfixed bits. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, just the previous. I think there's an order, right? The bits, the fixed bits, uh, depend only on the first i bit. Yeah. But so yeah. Is that my understanding? Right. Yeah. Bit fixing in general you allow to to set all the yeah here it will be in order but if it was even uh, more general this would the, the uh, if you could uh, yeah if that's what it produces that would be okay with us too uh, any such transformation would actually be good enough for our purposes all right um, <coughs> so yeah we should know what the entropy is but i won't talk about this these are the i mean the, uh, throughout the paper the only sort of uh, uh, results that we use are the ones from this thing and then we probably have to look at the Taylor series of logarithm at some point or the other and that is it you know and there is really nothing going on which is detailed in this paper. Uh, conditional entropy we should know what the definitions are and so on the chain rule etcetera etcetera and uh, the fact that conditioning does not reduce entropy it does not increase entropy is probably the most sophisticated theorem that is going to be used here ok. So, this is it is very very basic stuff and I would not dwell on it all right. Now, let me tell you what it means to give you an you know this iteration what do we really mean by it formally with the conditioning and so on thrown in. We will produce some 
mechanism which will be able to take 2 to the k bits and produce 2 to the k output bits which we will call a polarizing transform. So, for instance, if I took 4 bits a, b, c, d, the output might have been a plus b plus c plus d, b plus d, c plus d and d something like that. I will apply when I now want to produce an 8 by 8 transformation mapping 8 bits to 8 bits. I will take these 4 things produce these 4 outputs first and then along each column we have 2 identically distributed pairs. I will apply the same 2 by 2 transformation again. This is the transformation that is all. Okay? There is nothing more sophisticated in this transformation. So, for instance, if I desire to look at b plus d and f plus h, the polarizer will say output b plus d plus f plus h instead of either one of those and then f plus h as the second thing. <laughs> the it is what it is, it is a z, <laughs> but, uh, but that is the yeah. Um, now, this is what we are doing in the encoding and the, the encoding is completely determined by this transformation. Okay? So, it should be clear. The analysis will have to talk about what is polarizing and what is polarizing is usually we look at the entropy of any one of these objects condition on things from the past. Okay? So, condition on things to the left of them. So, in case of b plus d I would have been reasoning about the entropy of b plus d condition on a plus b plus c plus d and say that this is actually going to be some fixed quantity which will be smaller than the entropy of A or, or entropy of sorry B plus D for instance. Okay? And same thing with F plus G. So, these are the entropies that we would be dealing with. We will say these are both the same quantities and they are independent, but after one step of polarization these two quantities should be maintained in some but they should be separated distinguished and what will happen. So, what are the quantities we will be looking at it will be the entropy of this output bit conditioned on all the things that we were looking at over here. That would be for this guy for this guy it will be entropy of this output conditioned on all the things we are looking here and additionally on the output there. Okay? So, this is the process it once you apply this at every stage this completely tells you how to do the what to analyze and then the question becomes how do you analyze this. Okay. Uh, if you recurse, then you can forget all the rest stuff anyway. Right during the recursion, but you have to keep keep in mind that what you are analyzing is the entropy of some Bernoulli bits condition on some things and this variable conditioned on this would be identically distributed to this one and independent of everybody here. Ah, okay, good. So, so this tells us how to polarize, but then we have to figure out how this is you know which bits are very entropic and which ones are not. I will not talk about that today, but a there is an algorithm which can find out which bits were we should out which ones have the all the entropy and which ones are have very little and uh, b even if you don't worry about the algorithms this gives us a non uniform coding scheme okay no i mean i'm polynomial time algorithm uh, polynomial time algorithm which will look given you know the number n and this construction of the codes will output the subset in time polynomial in n will output a subset which is good for you. Okay. There, is no nice formula for it. there is no nice formula for it as far as we know, right. I mean Emmanuel is look I mean, at uh, yeah, but no, yeah. In fact, I mean the algorithms I will tell you a little bit about what is open over here or maybe I would not, but uh, offline you can ask me there is some things that part of the algorithmic things are also have some answer, uh, you know some unanswered questions there. All right. So, so summary. This is an entire transformation, by the way. Sorry. Okay. Maybe I haven't got the entire transformation. So, just what does the transformation typically do? Takes n independent bits, produces n bits, which will have the feature that each one of these bits condition in the past. The I mean, there's an invertible transformation. So, if you look at the entropy of w i condition on w less than i, these quantities will sum up to the p times the entropy of n. But our hope is most of these guys have entropy very close to conditional entropy very close to 0 or very close to 1. 
we will only output a subset s of these coordinates which will have size roughly entropy of p times so n and that is our compression scheme. So, you perform this invertible map and then output a projected down to a subset that is compression. The matrix may be not. Really? Yeah. So much easier to some people to just see the matrix and the tensoring. And the tensoring. Uh, yeah. I do not know that we will actually show the matrix and the tensoring. Okay. Wait, you described it. Is there something? Else? No, I do not think so. That is, I mean, it looks like a Hadamard matrix yeah. of some form or, or something. Exactly. But, or, yeah. Uh, I think if you did plasma, right. Yeah. So, there is decoding which can be implemented in polynomial time. Uh, the rough idea is that if you sort of look at what is the end, you know, uh, <clears throat> so you can actually compute the following thing. If I tell you the first i minus 1 bits, how they ended up being, there is an algorithm which is efficient, which can actually estimate what is the probability that the next bit was 1 or 0, conditioned on the fact that this is, you know, knowing that this is, these are independent Bernoulli bits. And this computation can be carried out efficiently and in fact in time n log n or something and this gives us a way to uh, decode efficiently. I have a few slides on the decoding, but I do not think I will go into it given the, the interest of time. So, we would like to figure out, so, so our decoding procedure is going to be the following. I have been given some of these bits other bits are labeled question mark. I do not know what they are, they have been erased. First thing I will try to do is to complete the sequence and say, let me actually tell you what was everywhere. And then there is an invertible transformation which can tell me what the z's are. To complete this, I will say, okay, let me look at the first i minus 1 bits. Inductively, I have been able to compute all of them, even if there were holes there. And now try to figure out what is the ith bit. And what is my estimate on the ith bit? I will compute, ask the question, what is the probability if I pick z? to be random from this Bernoulli distribution that I get the prefix that I have gotten and you know uh, what is the probability that I would get 1 in this coordinate given the prefix and c condition and uh, given that I am coming from this distribution. That probability is 1 for the bits. No, this probability is going to, so this is a quantity entropy of this W i given these guys is very small for the missing bits. So, this probability for typical z should be very high, very close to 0 or very close to 1. And so, most of the times I will say, oh, this bit is going to be 1 with very high probability, then I will say, okay, it is 1. Most, but even if it comes out saying, oh, this bit is going to be 1 with probability 0.51, I say it is a 1. Okay, just do. And that does not hurt. That, don't, that will not hurt. Okay. So, it is not failure. I do not think we will do the analysis, but it is sort of a straightforward entropy calculation saying, this thing will occur very, very rarely. Okay. Most of these probabilities will be for typical z, but for randomly really chosen z, one. very one close n. to 0 or very close to 1. So, it really means what, 1 in n or? Less than 1 in n. Less than 1 in n. Less than 1 in n. So, p is required to be known for this decoding algorithm? p is required to be known for this decoding algorithm. In general, you want to know not only decoding algorithm, to figure out which subset to use, I need to know p. So, Yes, all of this is sort of worked into the calculation, so you know. I suppose you can estimate it by just looking at the number yeah. of question marks. Yeah, just you can do a sum. No, you, well, you, you, do do sum. Sum. you do the sum of the, the one and you have exponential computation. Right? It's not a big, I mean, maybe you can get a good estimate of P. Right. You have access to this. Mm -hmm. No, all right. So, <coughs> sorry. So, all the running times are thing and we can actually determine which set you should compress to and that is a result I believe of Thal and Vardy. Uh, all right. So, the analysis of this entire thing relies on what we call the polarization martingale and this is the concept that I want to co focus on this talk. So, it is a, so just sort of quick reminder a martingale is just a sequence of random variables which have the feature that if I look at the expectation of the ith variable condition on the first i minus 1, it equals the i minus 1th variable, the value, the realization of the i minus 1th variable. Okay? So, standard familiar stuff, hopefully. And 
in our case, what we will be looking at is the following. So, the only randomness, so these are supposed to be you know, random variables, but in our case, what is the randomness? It is not these Bernoulli bits, no, that is gone. We are just, those are in the, that is specifying a distribution. Instead, I am going to say, look, I have these n variables, right, x 1 to z 1 to z n or w 1 to w n. I am going to pick one of these at random, let us say w sub i and look at its conditional entropy condition on the pass w 1 through w i minus 1. What does it look like is, is the question that I am. So, what is the entropy of w i minus 1 and you can. So, th the way this polarization the uh, polarization transform was described it was a sequence of transformations. I first took four variables and then constructed four new variables. Then I took eight new variables and you know eight variables and constructed eight new variables etcetera etcetera. So, there is a sort of a sequence of transformations which looks like a butterfly roughly. I am going to pick one of these rows in this matrix and follow that variable. board just to. So, initially I am given n bits and I take the first and the uh, n, n over 2 plus 1, the second and the, the next one etcetera and calculate these summations and then send this over. This is the first layer of polarization. The second layer of polarization then does something recursively on the first half and does something on the second half. So, this is the whole sequence. So, now I am going to look at a randomly chosen row here that is the only randomness. I am going to look at the entropy of this bit condition on everybody above. Well, that is just entropy of p there is no all the other guys are independent. Then I look at the entropy of this guy condition on everybody above. Then I look at the entropy of this next stage and the next stage and so on up until I come to the end. I want to say that the entropy of the last guy condition on everybody above is very close to 0 or very close to 1. But in order to understand prove that statement I have to follow this entropies as they are going along and say what happens to them. Wait, it is exactly a butterfly network? No, it is exactly a butterfly network. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 yeah it is often called the polarization butterfly and so on. So, yeah. All right. So, this is the quantity that I want to follow and this I claim is a martingale. For instance, if I look at this particular bit over here. If I tell you what is the conditional entropy at uh, or let me say maybe I look at this bit here. Okay. So, let us follow these two rows or maybe I am following this guy and I am telling you that the conditional entropy that I see at this stage is some number. It is indistinguishable because this variable is identically distributed as to whether I am talking about this bit or that and they both have exactly the same conditional entropies. After one step, I am going to be either looking at this guy or this one. Okay. As far as I can tell, i only tells me i is equally likely to be this or that. At the next step, it will be one of those two, but the expected entropy here is the same as the expected entropy there, but there is some polarization going on. Okay. This is the polarization that we want to track and try to prove properties about. Okay. So, yeah, define polarization. No, let me not do that. I will come back to that question in the next slide. There is two interpretations of what polarization is and one of these you know, one of these just says at the end these guys have to be very close to 0 or 1. Exactly. So, we will yeah, okay. So, we will get to this in a minute or something. Okay. So, let us ask the question. So, at the end we want to say that this is the entropies are conditional entropies are very close to 0 or very close to 1, but what is happening in the intermediate stages and how do you you know how do you abstract the properties to prove something about them. Madhu, I yeah. mean, just in terms of defining polarization what Sanjeev asked, is, mm -hmm. is, I mean you define it if you take two coins independent of bias or probability, you toss them together and what you disclose is the exclusive all of the pair. Individual entropy, one and the 
So I want to distinguish, I mean, you're, you're, there are two different concepts going on. One, what happens at the end, which I'll, but after one step is a different process that I'll call local polarization, and I'll tell you why these two are somewhat different. Okay, local, okay. So locally, I'll abstract it in a moment and we'll see it, okay. So <clears throat> firstly, in the end, what do we want to say? What we want to say is that most of these guys are very polarized, but now I'll be a little bit more quantitative about it. What I really want to say is that at the end, xt is very close to zero or one. The probability that it's not, that it's in the interval between lambda and one minus lambda is very small. But these two parameters actually behave differently for us, okay? Lambda is something which is, we would really like to be very, very small. It drives the probability of decoding error. If it was greater than one over n, naive algorithms would even break and you would have to do something more sophisticated. So really we want lambda to be like, think of it as one over n to the 10 is what we want it to be. Okay. Epsilon is going to give me my gap to capacity. I would like my n to be polynomially related to epsilon so that I can say already at some small values of n, this thing works. So I want my epsilon to be like one over n to the you know, square root of n, one over n to the one third, one over n to the point zero one. Wait, n to the square root n? Uh, sorry, one over n to the point zero one. Uh -oh. Okay, something like one over n square root of n, et cetera, et cetera, are all good values of epsilon. I don't need it to be one over n squared. Okay. okay. I don't need epsilon to be very, very small, but it should be polynomially gro shrinking with a n. Okay. Xt is a the probability that xt, the entropy, or yeah, I mean, the entropy of xt should not be in this re regime. Uh, sorry, oh, a, a, sorry, no, no, I'm sorry. Okay, xt itself is the entropy of this randomly chosen coordinate oh, okay. condition on the past. Okay, t is measuring time axis as we go along this way. We would like to say at the tth stage, at the final stage, the probability that my conditional entropy turns out to be somewhere in between these two is very small. But I want it to be really small in terms of the lambdas, whereas in terms of epsilons, it's okay. okay. And why, why is it okay in terms of epsilon to have one over square root n error? If it's say one over n to the one tenth even, it means that when I take n to be epsilon, one over epsilon to the 10, these theorems are useful. It's giving me epsilon gap to capacity. Um, I see, okay, right, because of the Chernoff like bounds or something, right, yeah. Epsilon will be, will not be much better than one over square root of n, you're probably right, uh, yeah. We won't qu quantify this particular exponent, we won't get very good ones anyway. All right, so these two parameters are what we care about, this is what we want to prove, and this is what we call sort of strong polarization. If I can prove that xt is going to be less than this, then I have got this martingale can polarizes strongly. Okay. <clears throat> so now, if you recall that n is also not independent of t, okay, as time progresses, the number of guys that I'm working with is scaling exactly like two to the t. So really, what we are trying to say is, when x t should be like some exponential. So if this is supposed to be one in n squared, it's like one in four to the t. On the other hand, epsilon should be like one over square root of n, it should be like one over square root of two to the t. So the acceptable behaviors for us are, for example, lambda is much, much, much smaller than four to the minus t. And now there's no n in this equation, there's only one parameter t that we care about. Whereas epsilon should also be growing exponentially small in t, but I don't care what's the base of the exponent. It can be any number less than one. If I can get this, then I say I have strong polarization. So this is the kind of a notion that we want to understand. The previous works where, so for example, Arikan's notion of polarization simply wanted to say, well, okay, you know, the probability that we are going to be in this gamma to the t to one minus gamma to the t is going to go to zero, okay? It did not try to give us a quantitative version of how fast it's going to zero over there. Whereas what we want to say is, well, it's actually growing to zero exponentially fast in t. And the difference between these is the difference between achieving capacity and achieving capacity at small block lengths. In the 
This is what corresponds to the Luby, Mitzen marker, et cetera, you know, resolving that question. This is just a way of getting codes that converge to capacity, okay? but not fast, not with small block lengths. So this is the phenomenon we are after, and this is what we want to prove. And I'm definitely running short on time, so we'll see what we can get to over here. No, 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 we'll see. <laughs> oh, it depends how hungry we are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing, anyway, that I want to say that we've already sort of discussed before is that all of these things that we were talking about are behaviors of what happens in the limit of T. Whereas the entire polarization process is built around these two bits and how, they, how I produce two new bits from it in one step. So there is the long-term polarization that we care about, but what's really happening is what we seem to control in the polarization matrix is what happens after one step. What's the evolution in one step? So this local versus global relationship is the thing that seems to be not too well understood. In particular, the following statements are true. If I wanted to ask the question, what happens to u, v, to u plus v and v, this is exactly the transformation that Guruswami and Shia or Hassani et al. analyzed. Now I can consider this, you know, clearly this is much weaker, but mathematically you could ask this question too. What instead if I started with three bits and produced three bits, which are somewhat polarized, what are these three bits? U goes to U plus V, V goes to V, and W goes to W. W is not even interacting, okay? just sitting there on the side doing nothing. Does this polarize? Does this polarize strongly? Does this polarize in this sense? Does it polarize in that sense? Okay. What was known was this process actually does show regular polarization. So even this very weak enough to give you Arikan's theorem and probably one of early papers of Arikan or Arikan and Telathar actually proved this. Because w will interact later. Eventually it will interact. I mean, it's exactly. I mean, just if you, yeah, exactly. So eventually everybody interacts, but except for one guy who just sits there not talking to anybody. And that doesn't matter. It's like in the limit, we throw away those things. But what about the strong polarization? And Truly, I mean, so there was a gap between these two cases. We didn't know how, what to say here, and our theorem basically says this polarizes as well. Everything that shows very weak polarization also actually shows very strong polarization. Okay, so, and the way we get to it is by really trying to understand the relationship between local polarization and global polarization. What local effects will be sufficient to get what global effects? And analyzing local effects is some, you know, calculus with the entropy function and so on and so forth. It's very simple. All right, so, so I think we've sort of talked about this and I don't want to dwell on that. Uh, <clears throat> so in general, we can say, you know, so there is this basic two by two matrix, x, y, go, u, v goes to u plus v and v, right? I mean, that's given by some two by two matrix. That matrix clearly polarizes. What doesn't polarize? Well, if you took the identity matrix, that doesn't polarize. I produce u, input is uv, the output is uv, that will not polarize, okay? Depends, if I give you two ones, then there is an ordering under which things polarize, and there's an ordering under which things do not, okay? So we will try to follow the ordering rigidly and say, okay, can I actually work under this thing, you're right. And if the matrix is, I don't know, upper triangular or lower triangular, one of these things where I, I wish I'd never get right, things will not polarize. For the same reason, each one of these bits is uh, an independent bit given plus some linear combination of the previous guys. It has as much entropy as uh, the bit that you, you think. Okay, so so it depends where you're looking from. So, uh, so if you if you take the whole world and you know do a couple of affine transforms, you'll be in good shape. <laughs> All right, so and if you can do a sort of a, I mean, um, if I permute the input bits differently, and then it turns out the matrix is not polarizing, it's still not polarizing, right? I mean, permuting the input bits is not. And that corresponds to some sort of a permutation of this matrix also. The rows are being permuted instead of the columns, and that would also not. So there's some natural conditions. Sorry, okay, I, I, I'm sure I'm go getting. I was multiplying on the right, I thought, but these are all wrong. 
Okay. All right. Okay. So everything. So there exists a definition of multiplication, <laughs> which. Uh, is. All right. So so you can. There are a few basic things that you can do, which is you know every output bit is a function of previously computed bits, and I don't have to actually. The kth bit does not have to be a function of the kth bit, but some you know if I do the permutation of the bits and then this is what I'm doing then also. So these are not things, and everything else is called a mixing matrix. And the main theorem is uh, so. For example, there was a work which said that uh, if this matrix is mixing, then the underlying ma ma martingale polarizes in the weak sense, and our theorem will say that it actually will polarize in the strong sense. Okay. If these matrices are not mixing, then it's trivially nothing is happening, and even in a single step, when something little bit is happening in a single step, the eventual result will be strongly polarizing. So that's the main statement of the theorem. But now let's get to a little bit of the proof, and now we'll talk a bit about uh, Zev's thing. So what are we asking for? Isn't it just these two things? So indeed, we will say that a sequence of ma step, you know, a martingale. So x1, x2, x3, and so on is polarizing. If at each stage there is a little bit of variance in the middle, and furthermore, when you are getting close to the end, you are actually getting sucked to the end. Okay? To get some intuition into why this, let us look at a. With respect to t? I'm sorry? Sorry. Ah, section no. Uh, w these matri these martingales are always taking a value between zero and one. Yeah. When the variable is getting close to zero, we want it to get sucked into zero. Oh, exactly. When it's getting close to one, we want to get it. So I'll formalize this in a minute. Good, thanks. Uh, but it's the end in the sense of there is an interval in which you're working with these martingales are uh, you know wandering within, and they should be getting sucked to the ends of these intervals. Oh really? Okay, so it's very plausible. I mean, I think I can. I I haven't seen an explicit uh, uh, calculation which sort of talks about this, but it should be. It's such a basic concept at the end, right? I mean, and uh, so all right. So uh, uh, before I talk about you know what's what are these things, let me motivate these definitions by saying giving you a martingale which does not polarize. You know, at time t, let's take x t to be x t minus one plus two to the minus t. With probability one half and minus two to the minus t with probability one half. Okay, this is clearly a martingale. You know, I'm with probability one half, I'm adding plus two to the minus t. With probability one half, I'm subtracting two to the minus t. Ex in expectation, is the same as what it used to be in the past. But what's the eventual distribution we are getting? It's the uniform distribution on the entire interval. Okay, from zero to one, everybody is just getting further and further and further diffused. So this is not polarizing, and we want something which avoids this. A few things that are bad about this. One is that as time progresses, the step sizes are getting very small, and we don't want that effect. We really want to say it doesn't matter what time it is; the step size should be a function of what your current value is, not what time it is. Okay, and that's going to be some enforced by the variance in the middle condition. Okay, and what it says formally. Is when x i minus one is somewhere between tau and one minus tau, okay, where tau is some constant, x i should show enough variance condition on x i minus one. Okay. So could you say a little bit uh, x i in this picture is what? Is the entropy that I'm seeing? I've picked a random i, but yeah. you don't know what it is. Yeah. All you're being told is what's the entropy I've got right now? Conditional entropy of this guy, condition on the past. Condition entropy of this guy, condition on the past, of this guy, condition on the past. Okay, so the past uh, or condition on the things above. Okay, so you're following the entropy of this guy as condition on the things above it, and so on. And this is x i, this is x i plus one, this is x i plus one, and so on. Yeah. Sorry, uh, i is this index. Right. Okay. Uh, sorry, um, there are two eyes, unfortunately. This eye is a different one than the one I was yeah, thinking of. Right. No, I'm really picking a random one because I really want at this stage to say I don't really know whether you were here or there. 
and the probability with which you are here is equal to the probability with which you are there. And at the next step. So in this one, the i is my column. Okay. Uh, but let's pretend I've said xj over here, OK? No, let's, let's just put i there, OK, in the column. Uh, but then there is a, all right, so. Oh, I'm sorry? No, no, this is just, uh, this was a poor use of i here. It's really should have been some other index, because I really want to think of i as a randomly chosen row. The variance is also over the choice of the row. The variance is over the choice of the row, absolutely. OK, so where is the variance going to come from in this step? It's going to come from the fact that these two values are not equal to each other, OK? and. I, when I told you what the entropy here was, you really did, had no idea whether it's this or that. These are identically distributed. So I could have been either one of these things. After one time step, you're going to be here or there. One of them has more entropy and the other has less. That's the variance. That's where it's coming from. Exactly. It's a martingale because if it's a random because it's a random row. Any further questions? All right, so what we are asking for over here is that a, after one step, the martingale you know, changes its value by a little bit. So there is a, some positive variance sigma, and <clears throat> provided you're not very close to the ends. If you're already, if xi minus 1 is 0, xi has to be 0, because at the next time step, you have to be between 0 and 1, but you're also a martingale. So that's the only thing. So you cannot have variance at the end, but you can expect for variance in the middle. And that's what it's asking. And the quantifiers are about as naive as you can ask for. As long as I pick some gap from the boundary, I should have some variance. So when should it be the entropy? People usually call this Mrs. Gilbert's lemma, right? Uh, when, when you analyze this property for binary entropy, this is my, Mrs. Gerber's lemma. If Mrs. Gerber's lemma is not even true for non-binary random variables, uh, but you can, you, this is much weaker than that, so you can actually get it for all kinds of uh, other. No con convexity, just Markov sufficient. I mean, Mrs. Gerber's lemma is a very tight version of the statement, much, much, much tighter than you need. And but here we are so coarse about you know if you really wanted to fa follow how much the variance should be given how far you are from the boundary and so on, you would use Mrs. Gerber's lemma. If you don't care about all of that, you just throw away positive factors over here left and right. You just get this from simple Markovs and and some crude back of the envelope calculations. Okay, so and then there should be some suction at the end. When you're getting close to the end, somebody needs to be pulling you back in. If not, you're not really uh, varying a lot. So what you need some condition at the end. And what's the condition that we want? What we want to say is that the probability that you'll drop by a constant factor is constant. Okay. But the dependence of these constants is all very important. What you want to say, in our example, for example, let's think of theta as 1 half. With probability 1 half, the next guy is going to be this upper bit, whose entropy we roughly know it's going to be the entropy of the sum of two Bernoulli random variables, the entropy of the sum of two Bernoulli random variables. This guy is going to be much smaller in entropy. So if these two started off with very small entropy to start with, this guy is going to have much, much smaller entropy. With probability 1 half, the martingale will drop a lot in value. So we want it to go down by a constant factor, and we get to choose what constant you want. There exists a fixed theta. In our example, thetas will be 1 half, such that no matter what you constant you pick, you can get that constant factor drop in the entropy. But what determines you can get this constant factor gap in the entropy? Well, the previous guy should have been very small to start with. So for there exists a theta, such so that no matter what constant factor drop you want, if you're close enough to the boundary, you will get that much of a drop. Okay? Does this make sense? We want a suction on the other side. Exactly. Yeah. We will want a symmetric suction on the other side. Uh, similarly, so if you look at 1 minus xi, it should have the same property. 
And once, I mean, so this is our definition of local polarization. And it turns out that once you have local polarization, you have strong polarization. And proving that local polarization holds for, say, Arikan's martingale and so on and so forth, the martingale that we are following over there was done and overdone in the literature, I would say. I mean, you have very, very, very careful analysis of how these things work. For our purposes, very weak statements suffice. And on the other hand, these very weak statements actually imply this very strong form of polarization. So that's our main theorem, the fact that local implies global. Okay? Makes sense? <clears throat> so what will I talk about today? Mostly a little bit about this local implying strong polarization. And maybe 10 more minutes if people are okay with that. All right. So I don't worry about it because the variance will happen because the other guys are varying. And this guy is killing the variance by pro probability one third, and nothing three, happens. Three, three, three. And again, the good things happen with probability one third, but you know that other guy just sits around doing nothing and so on. Mm. So you, you really see that, I mean, put together these things really capture that case. Yeah, as long as one of them is making progress, you're happy. And that's really the, okay? All right, so um, mixing matrices show local polarization. We won't talk about it. Let me talk about strong, why does local polarization imply strong polarization, which is probably the main thing that we care about. There's two steps in this analysis. First, you say that look after, let's say, t over two steps. I'll still call it t that you start showing some amount of polarization. What we really want is that the probability that xt is between 1 over 4 to the t to 1 minus 1 over 4 to the t is very, very small, is exponentially small. But I won't do that. Instead, I'll just show that the probability that between, it's less than 0.99 to the t and 1 minus 0.99 to the t is exponentially small. And this is what will happen the first t over two steps. So I'll apply this analysis for the first half of the case and say, well, many guys got pretty polarized, but not sufficiently polarized for our purposes. But And a few did not get polarized, and I'll just throw them away. I won't even look at them in the future. How do you prove such a statement? It turns out to be extremely simple. We'll follow the following potential function, which is just square root of xt and 1 minus square root of, you know, square root of 1 minus xt. I'll just look at this quantity and say that it's sort of dropping in expectation by a constant factor at each step. So after t steps, it would have dropped to something like alpha beta to the t, and then Markov's inequality will imply this for me. Okay? So all I need to show is that this potential drops by a constant factor. Now, why this potential? So to see why this potential, let's take something simpler, which is Let's take xt and 1 minus xt. Why don't we just drop the square root sign, which is going to make the calculation hard, and work with xt and 1 minus xt. Well, that's not going to help at all, because phi sub t is unchanged. It's a martingale. After one step, it'll be the same as it was before. So we need to do something. So you either take x squared, or you take square root of xt. Square root is the right direction. So you know, That's where the convexity leads us. And you could put any exponent less than 1 over here. This would work. Calculations may be a little bit more hairy, but that's it. Okay? So really, once you use this, in one step, this potential actually drops by a constant factor. You need to use both variance and suction at the ends. Variance in the middle, because that's what you use when xt's are in the middle. When you're close to the end, you need something, but suction gives you much more than you need for that part. So you're happy with this. Uh, right, but the expectation after one step will be smaller by a constant factor. Okay, so I would suspect it's true, but <laughs> unless there's a fundamental flaw in the analysis. But no, I think this is in the literature. People, for instance, looked at xt times one minus xt in the square root of the whole quantity. It's a little bit more well studied as a quantity, but it's a little bit more. Uh, delicate to analyze and so on. So for us, this was much cruder and much simpler to work with. Question? Uh, Question? Yeah. Uh, so the tau in the suction, uh -huh. uh, depending how close you are to the ends, that wasn't something that you got to pick, right? 
Yes, uh, so it got delivered to us by the, uh, right, yeah. I pick how, how much the thing wants to drop by, and somebody says, okay, then you're this close to the edge. Okay. But okay. it'll be bounded away from the edge. Okay, but how do you figure out, uh, you know, there might be a gap between where variance gets you and where reception gets you anyway. Right, so for this particular lemma, I get to choose any boundary that I want. Uh, and I'll choose a boundary which will guarantee that suction is pretty strong, so that I'll choose a boundary close to the end, so that I can say suction is strong enough once you're on the other side. And in the middle, there'll be some positive variance because that's what variance gives. So I choose the suction parameters and then, okay. yeah. Good, thanks. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so yeah, this works out, and there's Markov's inequality and so on. Then there's a second step which says that if I have already got some medium levels of polarization, so my variable is relatively small to start with, it's already beta less than beta to the t, and the next t steps, I want to see what will happen to it. And I want to say it will really be going down very fast. But here we are in a very good shape. We are in the suction regime. Things are going to be dropping by constant factors, very large constant factors, as large as I choose at each time step. Of course, they won't keep dropping by that constant factor. If this variable goes over the suction threshold, then I'm in trouble. But the suction threshold is something that I get to, you know, I get to take my beta to the t to be well below whatever the suction, suction threshold was. The probability that a martingale, which is starting here, over, you know, goes over that value is upper bounded, roughly the same way as Markov's inequality will tell you, you know, and that's called Dube's inequality, and that tells you that you'll actually always be operating under the suction regime. And as long as you're operating under, you'll be following by very, very, very sharp factors every once in one over theta steps. And that's plenty to, for you to say that you'll get extremely uh, sharp convergence. You're eventually going to go down to something like C to the T, and C to the T was under our control. C was under our control. Okay, so. That's roughly the things worked out in this analysis. I don't want, don't want to labor it. Uh, but yes, it turns out that it's like a very, very simple reason why things fall once you've gotten into this sort of regime where things are going to be slowly. Sorry, where is the. Uh, oh my God. Okay. Uh, so I want to say what's the probability that there is an interval between 0 to t? What's the chance that somewhere in between I get over this limit? And it's more or less equivalent to asking what's the probability that you're over the limit at the last step. And at the last step, this Markov's inequality tells you because you know the expected value of the last step. And so the probability that you're over a certain threshold is what Markov's tells you. Okay. And it's really just exactly what Markov's would give you if you made that switch. All right, so that's as much as I wanted to talk about. So all of this works out. So mainly, it's a simple analysis of strong polarization. Uh, I think, I mean, okay, I was a little too fast for most of you probably, but if you actually go through the steps, there's really no conceptually hard steps over here. It's very, very, and this idea of this concept of polarization, I really love it as just a pure probability concept. A random variable which is taking values in a bounded interval, you could now expand it to maybe variables taking on some values in a convex set and are trying to head towards the boundaries rather than trying to come towards the middle. What are the dynamics of these processes? What do they look like? Seems like a fascinating question to study and I'm sort of really happy that you know, codes have given us a reason to study these questions, but we should probably just study this on its own because it's such a beautiful uh, phenomenon. Well, maybe not always pleasant sometimes very unpleasant phenomenon, but uh, it's a very nice mathematical phenomenon. Um, and I think it'll be great to study much more. Okay, thanks.